Well, my relationship to carnival started when I was a toddler, actually, hiding behind my my mother's skirt because I was scared of some of, some of the characters in carnival. And that's an interesting thing because, in fact, carnival is exciting. I was excited as well, but a little bit, you know, scared because there are a lot of other characters. So that is very important for me because, in fact, that has indelibly printed itself on my psyche. Maybe this is the reason why I use carnival as, as a, a subject matter for my paintings. Um, but, you know, that's one of, one of the main ones. There's loads of characters. Carnival in Trinidad was a different thing. It wasn't just a, a, a celebratory parade, you know, in the street. It was more than that. It was a sort of cathartic, as I grew older, I began to understand. It was a sort of uh, a cathartic type of experience for people. It was a way to, to, to relieve themselves, the emotional stress, um, which is historic and sometimes domestic and, and present, you know. So it was, it was, Carnival was one of how I experienced it, as you would see perhaps in some of my paintings, was a lot of dancing, this movement, this bright color, um, you know, uh, it was a terrific subject to paint. And it didn't, I didn't decide this is what I'm going to do. It just happened. When I'm painting pages of carnival, you know what I'm doing? I'm going, dun, 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 and I'm painting and, and singing. And somehow I get into the rhythm and I, I'm moving, but I'm painting, you know. So, so it's, it's, in your, it's in your blood, really. You know, you're hearing it. You can hear the rhythm sometimes. You know, like a heartbeat. You know, and that's it. And that's one of the reasons why I use it as a subject for my paintings. But also, of course, it's folklore. And a lot of, uh, there's a lot of folklore in, in Carnival um, based on the past, um, you know. And also, too, it's um, Carnival, some of the characters are from a, a different background. Well. Disguised, use that disguise as a disguise. So therefore, we have characters like Chinese Mama. You will notice that, in fact, when you look around you, you see a loads and loads of different things. You find bones from some of my dinners, all right. Um, I've got stones that I find interesting. I pick them up because it's um, when you're a painter and a writer. Your environment, you can you engage with your environment. You cannot ignore it, you know. And it, you, do, you never know when you're going to use those things, those objects, but it's there. And sometimes intuitively or some, uh, unconsciously, when you, and you notice in some of my paintings, it's very gestural. Some of the gestures come from maybe just glancing up and seeing a shell or seeing something, and I go for it. But it's... Um, Again, it's based on the idea for me that art painting is a visual language and you get everything that's around you f f feeds you, quite frankly. Sculptures from African sculptures and so on. And uh, when I look at that, it reminds me that we have come from, basically, my ancestors. So I didn't think of art as a career. But when I was told, I can do that to somebody who went to Goldsmith College, was running the studios. I thought, oh, oh, that's easy. I can do that. I've been doing it ever since I was a toddler. I can do that. I used to get in trouble filling my, my books with uh, drawings. I mean, not supposed to be drawings. You shouldn't be drawing my book, but I do that. And copying things. I can do that. When I got here, I realized there are hundreds of other people with the same talent at Goldsmith College. And I started to learn then. Properly. So that's how I got here, you know, through that. And the interesting story is that I had only money for six months. I missed the scholarship. And I, in a very bold way, decided that's it, I'm going to go anyway. So working, having been working in civil service, I saved some money. It was only money for six months. And I thought, I'm going, my uncle's going to help me. He said he was going to help me. I got here and he didn't. He said, I wasn't going to help you pay for your full course. But from time to time, I'm saving some money. But I said, I can't pay for the full course. So I had to work for it. You know, so I did everything. My relationship as a student was quite traumatic because I 
I had to go and work. And of course, coming here in 1959 and going out asking for work, when things were in your face, then you know what happened, of course. You know, doors were shut. Said, no, we haven't got anything here for you. So that happened a lot. But it was wonderful, the support I had in the college itself. And I learned a lot because, in fact, I learned how to think of art as a language because we had people like Kenneth Martin, who was already Tate Britain. We had a lot of, we had Adrian, Adrian Ryan, well known painter. We had Sam Rabin. They saw who, what I had and what I could offer, and they helped me. And I get very emotional when I think about that, really. That's how I managed to, to get through. And to, well, I never stopped painting, I never stopped. And my bed sits were a landlady's nightmare because I always had a leash. I was always painting, always writing in all my books and everything. So I just kept going, you know, never stopped. What helped me again while I was there is looking back from the family I had. They were, you know, part mixed race, but they had a sense of independence and pride. They believed in education. My aunt was a teacher. When my mother died when I was nine and I had to go on to Bagos to live with my grandmother. And that's where I met my aunt Christine and she was teaching. And she played a piano. I was saying to somebody over there, I was, could you imagine, while I was hiding up in the tree reading, reading, I was listening to Beethoven and Schubert that she was playing on the piano. So I didn't realize that until years afterwards when I started listening to music. Said, Wait a minute, I was hearing this when I was very young and it stayed with me, you know. So. Uh, that background, and, um, and my father's very independent. All my uncles, the seven of them, six, four uncles, and they were all independent. They all had their own jobs. My father has his own business. That's why I had the education I have. Because without his not having his own business, employing five other people, designing and making shoes handmade, you know, I wouldn't be here. Because he had to pay. In those days, you had to pay for secondary school education. And, um, you know, and uh, you had to pay for the clothes, the books, everything. And we had three others coming after me. I was the eldest, you know. So through him, so when I came here and, and had that problem, and I was very depressed, I won't tell you how far the depression I was, um, I went back to thinking about my family and where I came here and what I left behind and didn't do that to fake come here to fail in any way, you know? And so therefore I wanted to, and because of the way I was brought up, I was thinking, I mean, you see, who, what other kid would be at the age of nine, 10, 11, being let free in a forest, going fishing in a river across all land, things like that, on top of the education, reading and, and so on, you know? The, the river was not, the pond was not too big enough for, to flow the thing for Teacher and Roger in Florida and Amazon. But, you know, it was that sort of thing. And I made things. I made all my toys. I made things with my hand. And all that tied into to being creative as well. And scared. Because I remember once in the old land, I, it was dry season and there were only little patches of water. And I went up a different route. And I felt suddenly terrified as though I'm being watched. And you know, it was, it was scary. It was quiet. And I thought, oh my God, what's this? You know, that some other entity was around. I felt it. So I ran all the way back home. So, so you can understand, I don't know if it's because I had overactive imagination because of the folklore and all the rest of it. That might have been part of it too, you know, but I felt it. So all of that comes into my paintings and in my writing. I knew John Clarose and a few people like that, but I was up north. So although I was on the periphery, if you like, they were, John, he was aware of me. They were aware of me because they had the Caribbean connections. I was in that exhibition. You know, Errol Lloyd wrote something in there, I think. Um, John LaRose was involved. Not, was like, so I was part of it in a way. 
you know, but um, but and John was apolog almost apologetically said that John, you were always on the you know you f you know you wouldn't right bang in the middle of the time. Everyone was more involved than Paul because they were in London. Well, I was out of London, you see, and uh, and doing thing. But I was aware of that. So, and and it, it, I was in the spirit of it. So uh, that's why I was included in M Ronald Moody, Robbie Williams, myself. Um, you know, uh, um, what the, the sculptor Bill Ming, because we gave Bill Ming exhibitions when we had a gallery as well. So it, we were there. Um, we were of that generation, and we all had the same sort of mind thing. You know what, what I'm trying to say. We weren't just playing at it. When I first was confronted with it because of my the way my mindset about what carnival was like I found oh, how am I going to do this because I had in my mind the images of, a, of carnival in a different way so the two things I thought of first at carnival I know a little bit of the history it came from Europe for this part, and it was linked also with Africa in with the age of masquerade so right so th that already made a link, so it justified my wanting to, to do this. And then the second thing that came up was, uh, and of course it's linked with religion, having been christened a Roman Catholic and confirmed one years ago, which of course I'm, not, I'm never, you know, those days was going to church because of, you know, really, but I'm not a, really a church goer at the moment like that. But I still have retained some of the things. And I realized that um, Carnival was linked with religion. This is why I did Eloy Eloy. I felt um, it was important for me to do it. And the reason why, for the first reason, is that um, of the Carnival link. And also the other reason is because art was um, a universal, fundamental thing. You know, I think about it, art as a language, right? And that's the second one. Because when I did that, I thought, okay, I've chosen the deposition. And I thought, wow, this will go very well with Eloy Eloy. You know, because Eloy Eloy was an alive Christ, you know, human by all appearances, maybe in having, according to the religion, endowed or with attributes of, you know, of divine. But he was then a human. He was saying, why on earth am I here? You know, on the cross, suffering, basically. That was his human cry. So it was Christ. And then he died, of course. And that's the basis for the Christian religion. Because he rose again. The position is taking him down from the cross. And what I like about those two paintings, I like, so they were both gestural. Right, because with my, you know, expressionist gestural movement of the loy loy, and I saw in the deposition a tangled, rhythmic figure, a dead figure, quite limp, being taken down from the cross. The people who take carrying the weight of of Christ King from the cross. So there's the link I saw. With David Bumberg, I chose, that puzzled me to begin with. And I, I decided I have to look more, find out more about this guy. I was attracted to it because it, I like the abstraction. But when I saw the title, and it's a Holy Week, and you know, the procession of the you know, Virgin of Peace, hmm, that's another link. Carnival. And I had to look him up to see more works in what he's done. So I did. And I thought, wow, he lived in, you know, in Spain for a while. You know, he was, that's where he must have had the sympathy with everything. Rhonda actually was actually part of that battle, religion battle, you know, between the, you know, I mean, the Russians and were involved with that as well, and so on. And, you know, so I thought, okay, it's, that's good. That's good. And I loved the idea 
of his up vertical abstractions. And it, it's like, and it was an, well into, and that, I mean, say, the difference between his abstraction was sort of dignified, but still, you know, I can see the relationship of the possession, you know, carrying candles, you know. Uh, and it's quite different to the movement of Eloi Eloi. Eloi Eloi is, 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 is taught it. And, and that, you know, they're both abstract in that way, but in different ways. And that's what I liked about it. And, and, and of course, it's the language. They're both kind of doing the same thing. You know, mine's like, it's figurative, obviously. But I've got written on there, Matisse said, color and form are not, they don't merge. They're simultaneous. So whatever stroke I make, even if it's a dot, it's a form. So if I go like that, it's a form. They, and they're not, you know, that's a form in its own right. So putting one form against another in an abstraction, even if I'm slashing and, and they look figurative, it's still not. But I love the idea of the serious and the figure, you know, the figure expressionist anyway, because it's, it's, it's part of my nature too, you know, expressive, you know, that's what it is. I can't help it. I can't help it. And I love, I love, and also, it, um, it, when I, I read of other people like Brock, he says something like, why do you want to paint nature exactly as you see it? It's, it's, it's you know, why? You know, if you want to do it, you use a camera. For the, if you want. But why, why do that? It's, 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 it's a delusion. It's fine. You can't do it. You can't imitate that. What a profound thing nature is. How can you go beyond the surface and express how profound nature is by just painting on the surface of it? You know, so although I can do that, because I've got the skill to do it, thanks to Goldsmiths College and all the teachers and tutors I've had, I can do it. I can paint, and I love painting portraits every day for, for people to please them, you know. Um, if they, you know as long as I can put something, little, little, you know, a little bit of my own head, but I do love actually exhibiting of, with artists who of that past, like Bomberg, Sutherland, um, also Picasso was one as well, because I feel welcome to a coterie of creative people based on the idea that art is fundamental as a, as a language that everybody uses. But also, when you think of Picasso, he went to, and also Matisse, they went to abroad and get inspired. I mean, see, I was told that Picasso, he couldn't stand when he went into, a little chocolate, one of the places where he saw the sculpt, the mask, he was so moved, he saw the power in them. Les Amoiselles Ravignon, he painted Les Amoiselles Ravignon. That's what, and that, that really is something. With, with Bergel, um, actually, he, he was a commentary on life. Time. And of course, that's important. Because although we, we all, I mean, if you're an artist, that's what you do. I mean, you're not isolated from your environment, from by something. And sometimes you're influenced in a way that you don't even understand or don't know you have. So, and if you're a real artist and you're, and you're painting intuitively, you know, the aspects of your psyche come out in your, if you're, if you're a musician, it comes out in your music. If you're a writer, it comes out in your writing. It comes in your painting, it comes out in your painting. And um, that's how I think. So therefore, my view, perspective, if you like, of art is, has got a universality about it. And I always quote the fact that um, it's so fundamental in fact, that we were all very first uh, example of it is in the cave paintings. You know, not just the bulls, you know, the hunting. They did it for different reasons, of course. They didn't think of it as art. You know, but the prints of, of blowing on your, on your hand and, and leaving your mark, that must have been significant. They must have found out how important leaving a mark on a surface is. So um, 
you know, so when people, you know, it was interesting, you know, when you come from my culture, people always want to say, put you in the box. You say, okay, fine. Oh, he has to paint black things. He has to paint a board. He says, okay, fair enough. But it's, it's so universal, especially if you come out, you might still be, I always say my navel string, tr string is still buried on the tree in, 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 uh, in Trinidad. That's a metaphorical way of saying that it's still in your spirit. You've been born there, so your cult is there, and I'm drawing on it all the time. But Earth is a small cosmic rock floating in space, and we are very close together. We don't realize it in distances, you know. But if you, if one, if you want to start looking in a different way and thinking in a different way, you begin to realize how close we are. You know, um, you know how close we are. Let me say, <laughs> oh, you think of an ant or a fly. Just think of they still occupy the space in the same way, but they're still interconnected in some way. So that's the the idea behind. Uh, you could call it homespun philosophy, if you like. I don't know what you call it, but that is the idea that that actually energizes what I do creatively. You're, you're living your art, you're breathing it, heaven's sake. That's why you're alive, you know. You are here because of all this interconnections that we don't hardly really fully understand. So that's where I'm coming from. And this maybe this is why I write too, you know. Because of that very reason, it's, um, you know, putting words together, putting colors and shapes together, putting... And of course, uh, the other thing that I think about when I when when I, I when I hear I saw somebody was talking recently, and um, I can't hear music and not, and my body responds to it. I just, oh, oh, I can move any part of my body to to a beat, you know. I can do that. Why? I'm not thinking about it necessarily. My body's absorbing the sound somehow. I don't know. It's there. And I think of it in the same way, you know, painting and music and writing. And with the, the European art and art from the Caribbean, the painters I we know paint. There's a big, they're, they're one of the, the differences. And the fact is that um, the same idea I talked about, because you're from a different culture, you expected that you paint, you know, like a black person or of that culture. Okay, that's okay to a certain extent. But then you start thinking of art as a, as again going back to this universality, and of the language. You know, it's, you know, it's, um, there's a, I can see the links quite easily. I may say, I just talked about Matisse you know, and, and Chagall. You know, the color aspect. I mean, to say those colors are fantastic. And I think Matisse got it from Morocco. I mean, when you think of Gauguin, which is colors, he went with a different culture. So um, it's, it, all the time it comes back to me how important art as an expression, visual art, uh, creative expression is. You've come, you know, obviously you, you are uh, energized or pushed on by your, your culture, obviously, while I paint carnival. Carnival is really something that people naturally are drawn into, I think, because of its, the quality of being something that releases your energies. You know, it was there in the masquerade a different sort of energy because they believe in something else. Each object has a soul and all the rest of it. And they, you know, the, the, the guy who was a priest or whatever, he would put on the skies and probably, you know, he'd dance again, music and nobody. It's a ritual, basically. Um, so in a, in a way, kind of is like a ritual. You know, I call it, I love the word phantasmagoria because that's what it is. All these images go past procession. Some of it is dark, some of it is joyful, 
but you're always reflecting always your environment, who you are, and other people around you. I think I, I you know, I'm, and therefore it's, it's obvious and obvious and natural. Like coming from a background like that, it's an obvious thing for me to, to do. And I didn't realize how much I, you know, painted carnival until looking back at some of the things I've been doing and writing about it, I realized, it, you know, um, and also um, writing about it, the poem Behind the Carnival is, um, is one which I'm going to read, I think, and it's going to be uh, telling you something what where it's come from. It's a life thing, it's part of life, things happen socially, physically and everything else. And it's part of, of, of life. And maybe this might have been one reason why the church could not, could not really suppress it and have to include carnival as part of the church's calendar close to Lent and season so that people can be licentious and, and they could really go as, as far as they want, sensually and everything else. But here comes Ash Wednesday when you have to go and repent your sins committed during that period or before. <laughs> it's, sort of, it's sort of interesting, isn't it? And it's part of that. It becomes very devout. And I have actually experienced that on, on going up to, you know, sort of the church and that particular, and Ash Wednesday, and Holy Week, Holy Week, the last week at the end of the Lenten season. Which is a bit, and the interesting thing is that once that comes, you feel light and everything else, but you start again because Carnival is a Sabbath institution that is, here, is an annual thing. And there are masqueraders or Carnival people who actually live for it. The, the designers immediately, as one finishes, they're already in researching for the next one. And people save money so they can play carnival, buy costumes and play. play. And, um, and it's, it's, it's something everybody enjoys. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's wonderful to, to actually be exhibiting with both Errol and Paul, really, because um, the, I, I like um, the Errol's work. I like his attitude, if you put it that way, too. And he is actually multidisciplinary. He's multidisciplinary. The way he's, um, and he's contributed a lot to, in the right sort of way. And Paul, as well, I, when I first saw Paul's portrait that was bought by the, you know, by Tate Britain, I saw it at, um, for the first time properly at the No Color Bar in which I also had some things in there. And I said, wow, that's good. That is a good portrait. He did it quite young when he was young as well. Said, wow, it's something, yeah. And I was like, and when he got it in there, I said, oh, it deserves to be there. You know? I, I, I'm very pleased that um, we have the, we have exhibiting together, really. And um, it's almost like, um, because of our ages, it's almost like a landmark of some sort, and I'm glad it's here. I'm glad it's happening. Um, yeah, yes.